Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, we thank You so much for, uh, for giving us another day to come here and just celebrate You. And celebrate fellowship with each other, our, our, our fellow brothers and sisters, and uncles and aunts and nieces and cousins and, and children and grandchildren and You. We thank You so much for allowing us to have the opportunity to do this. And uh, the challenge that was issued out this week by the, the General Superintendent, Dr. Graves, and, and, and our, dis, our own District Superintendent, Dr. Borger, that we take a look at where our ministry is at. Each and every one of us. Not only, not only pastors, but, but uh, those of us who are, who are lay as well. God, I just pray we'll take a look and see wh- where we're ministering, whether it's from, from uh, scrubbing toilets or, or, or taking the trash out or, or just inviting, inviting people to church. That's a, that's a ministry. And God, I just pray that we'll totally sell out for you and focus on that and do it in a loving way that when people see us, they'll see you and know that, that you are different than any other religion and, 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 and all that other stuff out there, God, that you are different, that we can have a one-on-one relationship with you. I just pray right now that as, we, as uh, Pastor Brian brings the word that you've laid on his heart, I pray that it will be your word speaking through him and, and, and not his own. God, just, uh, just uh, hide him behind your cross and, and, and use him. Fill this place with your spirit, Lord. May as we leave this place, we'll be touched We'll be touched by you and go out there on fire for you this week. Thank you so much for everything, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I was sitting thinking just how many people in the course of my life I have been blessed to be a part of bringing to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I, I've been blessed. I mean, I really have been. I mean, there's been times in my life I've, you know, I, I shared with you walking down the street in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, being able to uh, witness to uh, a drug dealer, you know, who came up to approach me and accidentally got saved. You know, um, you know I mean, that was really awesome. And then uh, uh, walking down the sidewalk right here in Caldwell and I heard, you know, I, I, I've shared this story of, I was walking along and I heard this lady screaming so I went over and knocked on the door I actually looked in the window first that's what you would do, right? when you hear somebody screaming, it was a big window though it wasn't a little one, it was a big window I peeked in the window, saw this lady yelling at these two kids I didn't know what they did, maybe they deserved it you know, some kids deserve to be yelled at I got two kids, you know you know, um, so I didn't know what it was but, uh the kids were, uh, you know, little tiny ones, and she was just really just screaming, really screaming at them and stuff. And so I just knocked on the door and said, you know, is everything okay? She says, yeah. I said, well, it doesn't sound like everything's okay. And so I went in, and uh, uh, she just started bawling. Just, you know, just somebody to talk to her, I think, it was probably more than she's used to. But anyway, it turns out she a single mom who turned to prostitution to support her family. And I, 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 I was blessed to be able to lead her to Christ. You know, and, uh, um, and, and, I, and, I've, and I've just encountered folks who are hurting, sometimes in a lot of pain. Although, although in truth, I get, I get every bit as excited as when one of our kids accepts Christ. You know, I've been blessed to watch a lot of our teens come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's been just a thrill over, you know, I don't know, last five years or so. You know, I mean, it's just been exciting. So there's nobody that really commits to Christ. I don't get excited about seeing him make a commitment to the Lord. I go, ooh, that guy. Well, it doesn't matter whether he becomes a Christian or not. I haven't done that yet. You know, um, I haven't had that experience. But I think, I think you know, I, I wonder how many people I've been able to positively affect like that. And I just go, you know, I'm pretty proud. You know, you know, I've done pretty good, you know. But then I think sometimes about different points in my life and things I've done. I go, I wonder how many people I have negatively impacted for the gospel. I wonder how many people are going to miss heaven because of a garbagey job that I did of representing Jesus Christ. You know, there have been times in my life when, uh, um, man, I wouldn't hold myself up as it been the example, you know. And I just think, uh, um, don't misunderstand me. Jesus Christ died for our sins. It's all, it's all a personal relationship kind of stuff. But um, uh, I just wonder sometimes, you know, and I think I want to be the best example 
for, for Christ that I possibly can be. I want to do those things that are going to advocate the cause of Jesus Christ. And um, I just, just looking at this, sometimes the messages that we can send aren't real clear. They're not real clear. A man walked into a restaurant. Actually, there was a guy that was working there. This is a true story. It wasn't my story, but it's somebody's story. Uh, this guy was working in this restaurant. This guy comes up to him and he says, um, you know, I've been coming to this restaurant a long time. I've never seen a sign like that. The guy said, what's that? And he took him over. You know, at the front of the restaurant, it says, please wait to be seated. And he says, that sign right there. He shows him a sign. See, it's usually right by the front door. Usually you walk in, right? There's a sign that says, please wait to be seated. And you know to wait and somebody comes and sit you down, you know? So that was, that was the sign. Nothing unusual about that. Wait to be seated. You expect to see that in a restaurant quite frequently. But somebody was cleaning by the front door and they'd moved it. And they hadn't put the sign back there and they'd accidentally put it over by the bathroom. You know, um, <laughs> has a whole different meaning. Same sign, different meaning. Sometimes we need to be careful about the messages that we're sending. We need to be careful about what we're trying to communicate and how we're saying it. Sometimes we're not real clear. And sometimes we speak languages people don't understand. We use words and phrases they don't understand. We, 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 we think in ways that are clear to us, but not necessarily are they always come across right. Man, I don't know how many times in my lifetime I've said something, and somebody come back and say something, and you go, well, that's not what I said. And they go, yeah, that's what you said, and they tell you what you said, and you say, well, you use different words than I use. You said them differently than I said them. That's not what I said. I heard, this is what I meant. Communication's tough, isn't it? It's tough. It can trick you. It can trip you up. And it will sometimes in your life. You know, so sometimes we have to be careful about that. We have to be careful of the messages we send. Um, Jesus Christ redeemed us from our sins. He died on the cross for you and I. He atoned for all of our wrongdoings. I got to, I got to speak on that this morning with the kids in, in Sunday school. We were talking about uh, how we're lost in sin. Wages of sin is death. Each one of us has sinned. We've earned death. God doesn't want to give it to us. It's something we've worked for. We said, Lord, I have earned death. You give it to me. And I, I don't know, we're not quite that demanding. But yeah, we, you know, the, so when we think about standing before God on Judgment Day, it's not necessarily the fact that God says, boy, I'm really mad at this guy. I'm, I'm anxious to put him into hell. And I don't think that's it. I think that God says, you're going to go there, but you're going to go there in spite of my will and in spite of my son, Jesus Christ, who died for you. You know, we have that redemption. And we see what God did. But sometimes we fail to recognize what God is doing. And that's, that's the implication of what this verse tells me. The verse starts off with this. And I, and I went out of the uh, NIV here. Paul was a surfer. I've told you guys that, right? You remember Paul was a surfer. Because um, he wrote uh, 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 Luke, Luke, I guess, well, maybe Luke was. Uh, and he, when he's writing the book of Luke, he starts the book out and he says this. He says, oh, um, most excellent Theophilus. <laughs> You know, um, get that. Most excellent Theophilus. Yeah. Here, this is the second book addressed to Theophilus. Um, in my former book, Theophilus, meaning the book of Luke, in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. First off, let me tell you what philosoph- uh, Theophilus means. That's a really important name. Um, and I don't know if it was a name or not. Because, you know, a lot of the times in the... In the in the New Testament, actually in the Bible completely, like Simon becomes a Christian, and then Jesus says, no longer will you be called Simon. You'll be called Peter, meaning rock. So he changes his name. So sometimes their names were actually changed. And I wonder if this guy's name wasn't changed as well. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, you might recognize it out of there. The first word, theos, that's the Greek word for God. The second word, phileo, meaning friend. So this guy, his name or title means friend of God. Friend of God. In my former book, Friend of God. And I thought this book, could be, this, this book may have well been addressed to everyone. Meaning anyone who's a friend of God, this book is your book. This is the book for you when Paul's writing this one. You're, this is what I want you to know. You're friend of God. I looked it up in, of course, the dictionary. A person attached, phileo. A person attached to another by feelings of affection or personal regard. Um, that's a little bit different than what we normally think of as love. You know, in, in, the, in the New Testament, there are two words that are primarily used for word. Phileo, uh, for, for, for love. Phileo and agape. And agape is the good love that we all know about. The, the love of God. But this one, he doesn't use that one. He doesn't use agape. He goes to phileo, which means actually a friendship. It means... Uh, 
an emotional kinship there. You know, someone that you're close with. And I thought, that is so cool. Because he doesn't say just those people who are committed. You could say, how many people are, how many people are married? And everybody that was, is married would say, I'm married. Because you signed a piece of paper, you're married. But you may or may not be a friend of your spouse. You may agape love them, but go, I got a lot better friends than this one. You know, I mean, I'm not people here. I mean at the Baptist church. You know, um, those guys, not you guys, those guys. You know, um, you're, you guys are wonderful. But those guys, maybe the Presbyterians, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, this is a friend of God. This is somebody who is actually emotionally invested. Someone who has got that tight relationship that loves God. Not just a commitment that will withstand the pressures of, of, of everything else, which we need. Because sometimes, you know, I just, I think of my kids. I love my kids. I, I would die for my children. Sometimes I'd really like to kill them. You know, you, know it's, it's, you may not always have, you may not always have those emotional, you know, you know, lovey feelings, you know, but you still love them. So there's that, that's when agape comes in because that's what saves people's lives. You know, um, you know that, that agape love is, is a good thing. But the phileo love is the thing that actually makes it a, a sweet relationship that makes, you, makes it that friendship. He says, so my, the friends of God, the people who are emotionally invested, the people who really care, not the folks who are committed because they have to be because they want their get out of hell free card. You know, all of us want that. That's great. But are you emotionally invested? Do you acknowledge what Jesus Christ has done? And does that stir inside of you a passion for Christ, uh, the friendship of God? In my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And I, I just thought about uh, all that God does. And I, I went back, of course, you, you, I, I went back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created. Um, you can go back to Genesis 1-1 for that. You can go to John chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. And I thought, you know, the truth about God is God is always creating. Um, God just doesn't do idle. He's always moving. He's always active. I looked at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. I don't even know what it, I, I'm, I'm not running my, my slide here. Um, a, a person attached to another, you got that. In the beginning, God created. Uh, God, God can't help but create. The reason, he had, the reason he created is because it's his nature. That's the reason he created stuff. That's the reason he created the world. The reason he created mankind is for the same reason that people have children. You know, um, and uh, yeah, temporary insanity. Yes. Yeah. I call children resource suckers. You know, um, when Nancy and I were married, we had a wonderful relationship. Our marriage was strong. We were happy. And we said, hey, look how much extra time and money we have. Let's give birth to some people who will take that from us. (laughs) And I think it was Nancy's idea. And I said, that's brilliant. And so we gave birth to people who would take everything we have, strip us to poverty, and leave us in the dust when they grow older. That's, yeah, no. I mean, you know, from a practical standpoint, there's absolutely no reason ever to give birth to children. Worst idea ever in your life. You know it's true. You know, um... Except one thing, is you you give birth to this little person knowing that you're going to love them. As a matter of fact, you actually love them before you ever give birth to them. As soon as you think about them, you fall in love with them. You know, and you you envision all these wonderful days. Now, and don't misunderstand me, you probably didn't envision staying up all night, you know, all of the things. We just came through District Assembly this week. This is, District Assembly is when all the churches get together, and they have an ordination service where um, the pastors are ordained or commissioned as as pastors. Um... I remember my ordination service. Um, Brianna was about two months old, and I was holding her out in the hallway. I'm going to tell you this interesting thing about babies. You feed them two ounces of milk. You feed them two ounces, and then they give you back like 12 ounces. <laughs> and you, you, you give them milk, and then, and then when they're done eating, you go, and they, they just anoint you with it. 
And you, and you think, where did you get those other 10 ounces of milk from? I was holding her. I was dressed in a suit, getting ready to go up before the general superintendent so that I could kneel and that all of the pastors on the district could surround me to pray for me. As I was holding my beautiful two-month-old little girl who had just eaten two ounces of milk, she anointed me. I had this big stripe of, down the front of my jacket. And I said, Nance, hold her. I got to go to the bathroom like now. You know, and so she took, took her and I went in and I, I washed off my jacket, you know, and, I, and, I, and so when I was, they didn't notice it because it wasn't too bad. You know, it was a dark blue jacket, so it didn't do too bad, but it kind of turned purple. You know how colors are always a little bit different when they're wet than when they're dry. So I had this, this streak down my jacket from where my child had given me something as an anointing. Kids, kids are a bad idea. Um, but you know you're going to love them. And that's the reason you give birth to them, even knowing that they have the potential to break your heart. Even knowing that there's going to be a huge price tag involved, you still want them. And you still love them. And you still love them more than you love yourself. That's how much God loved us. And that's the reason that he created us, to have that kind of a relationship with us. So he created everything just because his nature is creative and idle. But he created us specifically because he wanted to love us. He has a loving nature. He didn't want just stuff that he could care about. He wanted that relationship. And he brought us into it. We were blessed to be a part of that. But then once we fell out of that relationship, he found a way to redeem us. He redeemed us in the Old Testament through the, the sacrificial system and in the New Testament through the ultimate sacrificial system, Jesus Christ. So this verse says, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. And sometimes we think about all that Christ did and he died on the cross and he rose from the grave and then he went to heaven. And then the story ended. Ah. He ascended into heaven. He was just getting started. Jesus was just beginning his ministry. His death on the cross, he said it is finished. He meant only this redemptive part. Just my stage right here where I'm at. Now we're going to get started with what's really going to happen. The real excitement came after the resurrection. He got started. You are living. We are writing Acts chapter 29. We're in the process of it. Jesus didn't end it. He started it. He got started with it right there. And that's... um. Uh, John 14, 12, I put down there for us. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus was limited by being in one place. You and I, we're, we're, we're without number. I mean, there's so many of us. How many places can we take the good news of Jesus Christ all simultaneously? You know, and if you're a carrier of Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit lives within you, you don't even have a choice. You have to represent God. You know, um, my favorite illustration on that is Charles Barclay. Charles Barclay was uh, this sweet guy that played in the NBA. He was nasty. The only person you could look at would be Dennis Rodman to get anybody worse than Charles Barclay. But Barclay was, Barclay was mean. He was a tough guy. And, uh, and, and, and I, I saw an interview with him once, and he said, I ain't no role model. And I thought, yes, you are. You don't have any choice in being a role model. You're a professional NBA player. People look up to you. You're just a bad role model. You know, we are Christians and we represent Christ. And when we say that we're a Christian, we say that we say we go to church and our faith is in God. You are a representative and ambassador of Jesus Christ in the world around you. You don't have any choice. What you have a choice in is whether you're a good one or a bad one. But people are watching you. And you don't have any choice in that. So, it's important for us to understand the voices, understand the messages. Sometimes we get that mixed up. Sometimes uh, we, can, we can get confused as to who we're, who we're uh, understanding. You know, um, understanding the voice of God is, is, is crucial to us. Understanding and being a friend of God, staying close enough to be able to discern. But sometimes we can confuse that with other people's voices or even with our own. Sometimes we get these ideas, and they're, they're good ideas, but they're not God ideas. I have brilliant ideas. I have tons of ideas. My world is consumed with ideas, but they're not all God ideas. And I have to be able to discern something that sounds like a good idea and something that's a God idea. 
And that's, that requires us to be in submission to the Holy Spirit, to be a friend of God so that we can recognize God's voice. Do, do you follow that? Sometimes, sometimes we get these ideas and we start, we start putting things only into little boxes where God is at church, he's not everywhere else. You know, I, I think we're just as confused by God as we are by the devil. You know, we always get those pictures of the devil. You know, he's got the horns, got the red suit with the tail. You know, I've never seen the devil like that. You know, you know when I see the devil, he's usually wearing a mini skirt and he looks good in it too. <laughs> the men got that. You know, uh, you know, I mean, I mean the, devil, the devil doesn't just come at you like, I've never seen this guy. You know, I've never seen that image. I don't, I, I, if I saw that, I'd go, oh, Hollywood. I mean, I wouldn't even recognize that. That's not it. The devil might come to you at some other temptation, some other point. He might look entirely different than you. You know, we, we need to be att- attentive to those, to those temptations. We need to be attentive to the voice of God, how he's going to speak to you. Usually, usually, when God speaks to me, it sounds a lot like Nancy. You know, you know, whatever voice, you have to be attentive to how God is going to speak to you so that you can hear him. You've got to be a friend of God. You know, there's usually a price tag attached to it when you hear God's voice. You know, um, I think sometimes we don't want to hear the voice of God. Sometimes we don't necessarily, I think, I think we don't always want to be the friend of God because there is, there is difficulty in it. I think sometimes we put on blinders. Uh, Jesus is still at work. Sometimes I think we don't want to be a part of it because there's, it's too high a cost. You know, um, I thought this. Everything in life is either growing or dying. It's one or the other. Maybe both, actually, I guess some degree both. But if you're not growing, you are dying. If you're not a part of the work of the kingdom, if you're not doing those things, then you've disassociated. You're no longer the friend of God. You know, and you're not a part of the work of the kingdom. We have to be attentive. We have to be tuned in and listening. I'd like to write you a good list of do's and don'ts and things that you could do. But I think that sometimes it's really important for us to understand on a personal basis where those callings are. You know, everything you do is not... You know, I don't think that God just says, okay, Pastor Brian, you're going to preach. You know, Eduardo, you're going to do ballet. You know, I don't, I don't think that it's that clean cut. I think that... I think that when you are going to the grocery store and going shopping, you have to do it as a Christian. You know, I think that when you're driving down the street, there's a good one for you. When you're driving down the street, you have to drive as a Christian. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah, I've seen a lot of... Yeah, that guy, you've heard the story. The guy driving down the street gets pulled over by a cop. Cop says, uh, the man says, uh, was I speeding? The cop says, no. He says, uh, uh, he says what, why, why'd you pull me over? He says, well, you were driving back there, and that guy cut you off. He says, yeah, I thought you were going to pull him over. He says, no. He said, when he cut you off, you started, you started screaming and stuff, and, I, and yelling, I, and I saw the fish on the back of the car. I thought maybe the car was stolen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, um, you know so, I mean, uh, you get the idea. Everything you do, you got to do as a Christian. You know, and it's not just one calling, it's, it's every single thing. And sometimes it's difficult because sometimes my voice can be louder than God's voice. Sometimes I get a little too much of me and not enough of Him. Sometimes I just need more of Jesus' priorities than my own. Tim Woodruff wrote this, We live in a world that has shaped our priorities, skewed our perspectives, and taught us what to value. Rather than permitting God to challenge those values, to confront and replace them, A great deal of energy is expended in the attempt to win God's approval and support of the values that God actually detests. We want God to baptize our standard of living, our pursuit of financial security, our accumulation of money. We want His approval of large houses, large bank accounts, large credit card limits. We want Him to look at our consumer culture, our capitalistic dreams, and pronounce, it is good. It is all theological smoke and mirrors, imposing on God a value system that is foreign to His very nature, It is culture dictating the shape of our faith. And in this, we are culture's collaborators. Understanding who God is, understanding His nature, and allowing Him to be the one who shapes us, rather than us being the one who shapes Him. Do you follow that? Not creating God in our image, but allowing God to be the one who has created mankind, but us specifically in His image. Fulfilling His image in each of us. I'm going to take another drink of water because I'm going to sing to you.
Um, I was going to rap, but um, I didn't want to do another rap. So I give those to Brian because he's deaf. He can't read my lips as well. Um, if you can't read my lips, I'll give you a set next time as well. But um, um, I assume you can. But I went ahead, and I, I, I don't write tunes, though, very well. You got that from my rap last time, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, 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 so the musical part, not so gifted. And so um, I, I, I stole a song. And so I, I, I went with one that I, I tried to think of a, a, an artist that I would have fun with. Um, and um, I, I, I went with Huey Lewis. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I asked the girls. I, I asked them about the song. They they had no idea. It was I want a new drug. They um they they had no idea what I was talking about. They didn't know who Huey Lewis was. I was like, babies, just at Ernie. They are just babies. You know, how could anybody not know who Huey Lewis was? That's just terrible. So anyway, I got a song. You're gonna love it or hate it or maybe both. Whatever. Um, ready? Here we go. I want a new God. Doesn't make me reap what I sow. Doesn't make me pay a price. Never tells me no. I want a new God. Greater than our prayers. Makes the world politically stable. Knows what the fox says. (laughs) A God who won't make me nervous. So I don't feel no shame. He doesn't tell me to shape up or I'm going down in flames. Never going down in flames. I want a new God. Doesn't worry about what I say. Doesn't care if I gossip. Never makes me pray. I want a new God. One that's man's size. Gives me what I want. And never makes me tithe. A God that's got my values. A God that'll leave me be. Come to think about it. One that looks a lot like me. I want a God that looks like me. I want a new God so I can sleep in. He doesn't care about church, doesn't care about sin. I want a new God, doesn't care if I'm a jerk, doesn't care if I steal, doesn't care if I twerk. (laughs) Don't think about it. (laughs) A God who accepts excuses. For what I say and do, and when I lie to him, a God who hasn't got a clue, I want a God like me and you, just like me and you, a God who's kind of deaf and doesn't see me when I fall, come to think about it, I don't want no God at all, that may be what my life is saying, so uh, I'm going to. I'm going to close this, but we want, to, we want to rejoice in the God who does care, in the real God, not some fictitious character that we want to recreate, not, not that we want to box God in and tell him, here are the boundaries, you color within the lines of my life that I give you. But Lord, here I am, whatever it is that needs to change in my life, change it and make me in your image, acknowledging the price that was paid. You were bought at a price, a great, the, the sacrifice of our Savior on the cross is the reason and the cause for our redemption. We, We as a people, had rejected the truth. Lord, all of humanity stood in condemnation. Father, having walked away from you. And Lord, I, I I just know, Lord, that in my own experiences, I've done that. And Father, how many times um, I've lived my life unworthy of your grace. And Lord, I couldn't do anything about it. And I thank you, dear God, that, that you can forgive us for our sins. But Lord, even in forgiveness, you know how, how terrible our sense of forgetfulness can be, Lord. We can be forgiven by you, but still condemn ourselves. I thank you, God, that you are greater than our hearts, greater than our own condemnation even. Lord, that you are able to redeem us, Father, through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. The body that was broken, dear God, destroyed the hold over, over our souls. Lord, I thank you for that, dear God, that you are perfecting within each of us, Lord your own image, that, you are, that you've, you've given us hearts of compassion that yearn for you and that struggle, dear God, with this world below. I thank you, Father, for that victory. I pray, Lord, that each of us would know the freedom that comes, Lord, um, by being declared, declared righteous by the judge. I pray that that would be each of our testimonies. 
Father, this morning, I, I thank you, dear God, for the body broken for our redemption, Lord, and restored once again in the body of Christ, Lord, as all of we as believers join together as the risen Savior, Lord. Your body here on earth, use us, Lord. And thank you, dear God, for the sacrifice which made it possible in Jesus' name. You may eat together. Father, I thank you for the blood shed on Calvary to wash our sins away. I thank you, dear God, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I thank you, Lord, that we have a victory that overcomes the world. Help us, Lord, to live in fashions reflective of that and help us to be cognizantly aware of that on a day-to-day basis in all of our transactions. As the world drinks to forget, we drink to remember. <coughs> Father, help us to live this week in the fullness of your spirit, rejoicing in the freedom we have in the body in Jesus' name.